It's Christy. How are you guys doing? I am on for a really exciting chat today with my patrons. We're going to talk about H Bomber Guy's video about Sherlock and why it's garbage. But before we start, and meet my beautiful patrons who are joining me today. So we've got uh, on the left hand side under the name Idol. How are you doing, uh, Xander? Hey, I'm doing well. I think the last time I did one of these, Obama was still in power, so it's been quite a while. <laughs> That's <laughs> way too long. A lot have changed. <laughs> quite a lot. Yeah, the halcyon days of, of the Obama administration and all those, it feels like years ago. But. Mm -hmm. And then from down under, from the channel Lonely Wolf, how are you doing, my friend? Hello. So I'm Troy. So this is my um. This is kind of my avatar. So I, I, I don't have any professional artists. So I just like sketched it myself, and I covered him with a book because it looks pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it's pretty cold down. You got curl, got curled up with blankets. You're all warm yep. and fuzzy. Yeah. Yeah. Thank God I can crochet. It looks lovely, by the way. <laughs> warm and yeah, very warm and fuzzy. And next up is my longtime friend Matthew, my guy who I go out when I'm in Philadelphia. We meet up and we go to get get some great Southern style barbecue. Put your, Good afternoon, my, everyone. Put your mute off. My <laughs> yeah. Uh, your your tea. What treat tea are you drinking? I just have some Earl Grey. That's what I happen to have in the cabinet. Oh, nice. Excellent choice, Pap and John Patrick John Luke to Captain John Luke Picard approves. I was about to say call him Patrick Picard, but no, that's Patrick Stewart. Now I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's John. How are you doing, choice. some guy? Uh, hello, I am some random geek. You can call me Jonathan or John. John or Jonathan doesn't matter. Oh, some random geek. <laughs> <laughs> Works too. And Tom, Wisconsinite. Right. Hi, I'm Tom. I'm also part, partly Scottish um, with my Robert Burns shirt. So, all right, Scots I, way. I, I dress so great. Yes, I dressed up for this. <laughs> Excellent. And we're all here today. Well, one because um, I wanted to thank you guys for your support of the uh, Progressive Fund of helping out with um, in in the month of May funeral expenses for Heather and the other guys other things that you guys make possible on my channel but uh, so thank you for that one of the other ways that I try to reward my patrons is an opportunity to chat once a month and this time we're gonna be chatting about H bomber guys I think fabulous fantastic tweeting it at uh, Charlie Brooker to make sure he saw it documentary process of Sherlock and what so <laughs> we were talking before we had to swap on air locations about um, how we came to learn about H bomber guys videos because some of you know him for a while so so yeah should we just start out um, maybe with the reverse order with Tom um, impression of uh, H bomber guy and uh, any of those other videos that you've seen oh god I've seen uh, quite a few um, I don't remember how it was a while ago. I don't remember what I first saw, um, but I like I, I've loved his uh, uh, takedown of anti-feminists. Oh, it's it's just it's gorgeous. Uh, he is dry and funny, and, and I love him. Did I, no, I didn't. <clears throat> I'm manly. I'm Scottish. I didn't say that. <laughs> we like cheap. And John, you've got a quite a history of uh, the, the ways that his channel uh, opened you up to other things. Uh, yeah, this is a, actually, a, I'll, I'll go ahead and share this. Like a, a year ago, over a year ago, I kind of like find out like a close family member of mine is part of Gamergate. And so it's like, oh, wow, there's that. Am I weird for thinking that? It turns out I'm not weird for thinking that. And so then I kind of want to know about more about that. Somehow through Moobot's Twitter, someone tweeted that Moobot, hey, this guy made a video about you. It was the 
Sark on video to movie pop. And then and someone in that Twitter said, come on, H Bomber guy made a video proving Sargon's an idiot. And so I was like, who's this H Bomber guy? I gotta watch this video. This guy is entertaining. He's funny. Sargon is an idiot. And so through <laughs> and so through H Bomber guy, I discovered he used Garrett's video and linked Garrett's video. And so through that Garrett was really the gateway drug for me to the Fenma's YouTube community. That's how I, I learned about you, Christy. They threw um, H. Barmer guy and stuff like that. And you proving Sargon's an idiot. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> he did feature my debate in one of his, you know, that's my, my claim to fame. Yes. It's H. Barmer guy used a bit of my debate once in one of his videos. <laughs> Matthew, how about you? To be honest, I I had only heard from H, heard about H Bomber Guy from you, and this video that we're discussing today is probably my first video that I've ever seen of his. Interested to hear your thoughts then. Okay, Troy. Yes, um, uh, the first time I ever saw him, it was like a compilation video. So I remember, you know, he's the British dude with the British accent who is um, he had a fixation on skulls. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, yeah, so I, watched his, I, I watched his video in preparation for this and it's like the um it's just the, the production values are absolutely incredible and just the um the level of cultural criticism like very sophisticated agreed yeah and xander have you been along sorry say again yeah uh, you're are you a long, long time fan of each bomber guy okay i'm gonna be chastised here I've never heard of him before today. You're going to have to be my... You're going to have to be a sounding board or use me as a sounding board because oh, this right, is going to be fine. very interesting. <laughs> well, you heard well, anyway, um, so. For those of the people... Yeah, yeah, yes. Well, he's done a video um, which is very long. It's nearly two hours in length. But there's a reason why it's that length. And it focuses on critiquing uh, Stephen Moffat's and he does it by um, going through, in the first place, sort of the, the importance of Sherlock in British culture, very briefly. Moffat's history as a writer on coupling, and then on uh, some Doctor Who episodes, and then to Jekyll, and then to Sherlock. And he's got a lot of critiques about his, how he writes very well, and when he writes very well, what he does wrong when he really. And most of the episode is taken up with an examination of the uh, four series of the BBC Sherlock, or the series Sherlock, um, really just exposed what I think he says in the beginning, which is why, which is why, why people thought they liked it or used to think they liked it until they watched season four and then realized it had been bad the whole time. <laughs> Summary of the show. So, uh, yeah, you'll get to hear a lot about his take, I guess, on, on Sherlock if you haven't video. It's fine if you didn't, because if you had a chance to watch the video. I did get to see the video. I didn't actually watch the video. I was at work and listened to the video as, as okay. if it was a podcast. So I heard his comments. I haven't seen season four yet of Sherlock. In fact, I had mentioned earlier that I had just, I watched the first half hour of it this morning. Um, so I, I got a little bit of an impression of what's going on, but obviously there's still two and a two thirds of episodes left to go. So I don't worry about spoilers. Talk about what you need to talk about, but uh, I don't have, I don't have a full yeah. knowledge of season four, but I can, I can answer questions about one, two and three. Yeah, four was just a mess. But no, go ahead. You go. That was uh, John. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, uh, no problem. That was uh, for me. It's just like again, uh, H. Bomber guy was my first introduction to the show Sherlock, and so in preparation for this hangout, I kind of started like binge watching it, and only managed to get through the first two seasons. And, and so yeah, so I was kind of like seeing some of the overproduction problems that H. Bomber guy pointed out in the show, and as well as the writing and the continuous mystery, and every episode has to have Moriarty. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be yeah. like my new save Martha. Who did it, <laughs> Moriarty? <laughs> I will have to. Yeah. So. Uh, oh. 
I will have to start off this hangout by saying that as as much as I like Benedict Cumberbatch, Jeremy Brett will always be my Sherlock. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. One that really kind of embodied uh, so much of the complexity of Sherlock, and that that he would be um, cold and calculating, but he could also be childlike in his enthusiasm, and sometimes a bit camp, um, and a bit playful, and you know. So yeah, there was a, a greater emotional range in his performance than in in Benedict's. That Benedict's definitely, I would say. Yeah. So. From uh, from Troy, can I get your impression of of what you you saw from the H Bomber guy critique itself? You kind of mentioned it a little bit, but um, yeah, you want to talk just a, uh, out of curiosity, like yeah, on, um, on what the, he was having to say. Yeah, I think the video starts with I think it's the importance of preserving um it's the importance of preserving very important um parts of cultural canon because I know that um probably hopefully I get the opportunity to share like the Australian um, version of that, like how we've actually done certain shows that are part of that historical canon and how it has to be treated in a very um, particular way. And that's probably seems to be where it veered off track. It's a, it's a writer who doesn't seem to appreciate the, um, the, the with all of the particular franchises he's being given, um, just doesn't really understand that important part of UK cultural canon. Yeah, I think that was definitely one of the points about the way that all the things that made Sherlock sort of an idea that lasted for so many years, uh, decades, centuries even, um, he really unpacks, uh, takes all those good things and tries to reinvent them and make them something different. But he doesn't actually think through how he was going to make sense of things in his own stories, I think. I mean, it seems like the Stephen Moff was more interested in like the mystery box or the mystery and giving audience the mystery to like wonder and speculate and capitulate on, but without an idea of how to actually end it or solve the mystery. Or write a story. Or, or write a story, yes. <laughs> Yeah, I think he talks about, you know, like uh, the overarching story. And I'm fine states, they have overarching stories that go for 22 weeks or 24 weeks where you just get a little bit of a change throughout the season. And then the last two or three episodes really sort of culminate in the big reveal, setting up all the things that went beforehand. But, you know, with, you never really get that. You never get a solid conclusion that makes sense of all the things that you've been presented with point. So how about your take on, on the video? Um, we talk- can you hear us? Yeah, yeah you. I think. Oh, my take on the video? I think a bomber guy did a really great job in unpacking a lot of problems that Sherlock had mostly with his treatment of the source material. Because you can't write a mystery series and then constantly raise your middle finger at fans of mysteries. Like, LOL, your entire genre is stupid, so this is what we're going to do to it. I mean, because he takes the source material and he doesn't... I don't know, there's like no mystery there. It becomes some sort of weird mind game for Sherlock. There's no you know, solving, there's no real interaction with Watts, and I don't get why people have the tension there because... Everything that was in the source material is basically gone between them. And it's just, he did a really great job of just unpacking all the problems of the plots, especially with the Irene Adler storyline, too. Yeah. Because she goes from being, you know, an independent woman just looking to get out of what was a bad situation and being able to out with Sherlock because he got caught up in his own sexist notions of what a woman was supposed to be. I mean, that was the entire point of that storyline, was that Sherlock got caught up, you know, being a sexist dick. I missed a lot of stuff that he should have caught on to. And what happens in the TV show is she becomes a dominatrix, I think. Yeah. Sherlock. My husband made me watch the show, and I was just sitting there. And he was a Moffat fan, so, you know, he never read the source material, so he's eating it up, and I'm just sitting here going like this. And he's like, what's wrong? Yeah, I like the idea of what they did in the United States by combining those two characters. That was original, you know. But yeah, go ahead, John. Sorry, I didn't mean to jump in on you. 
Yes, uh, I, I, I found it interesting. It, it was kind of clever to like for in that show for like how Irene Adler kind of like thwarts Sherlock for a little bit or gives him no clues of like hey how to read her by going there naked, which is is in, in itself a weird and interesting scene. But like then again, all the times the the password for like the lock was. Her measurements and it's like oh gosh <laughs> yeah i mean it could have played that scene that first intro scene with the nudity could have been played wonderful had it not been for titillation <laughs> like had it not been just to see a naked woman on the screen because that was the only goddamn reason they put it in there i think my kiddo has her headphones on she doesn't hear her mom swearing about fictional characters in the morning <laughs> Uh, yeah, and and certainly, you know, um, they had uh, they, uh, they had um, Benedict Cumberbatch's almost bare ass on too, but uh, it wasn't quite the same titillating situation as they put Irene in. Sorry. No, it was. I don't remember him. One second. Nudity scenes in there, but I remember her because they did it like full frontal and like. I know for one thing, it's different on TV in England because you know they can show from the top up with women too, which. Honestly, I don't see why that's a big deal. We should be able to do that here, too. But um, they did the full frontal scene, and the way they set it up, it was obvious. The whole thing was like, Sherlock's totally turned on now. She's never seen a naked woman before. <laughs> what does he do here? Does he go and he touch the butt? Does Sherlock touch the butt? He can't even, Sherlock like, read what... Uses... Go Sherlock ahead, Matthew. Seven... Sherlock uses a 7% solution. He's touched women before. <laughs> <laughs> I think what you know if you kind of if you watch the video and you actually keep track of all the points that H Bomber guy is saying he's like well you know Sherlock is good except for the story the main character the main nemesis uh, the way it looks the, the John Watson character the Mary <laughs> so he starts going through and unpacking it and he really makes a very convincing case that yeah there's just flaws all the way down the line in the show and and I think what do is the way that he then you know ties it back to some of his other connects up these you know this um yeah inability having one good idea which could potentially be really interesting but not through on that one good idea like, you know, the Irene Adler thing. Yeah, maybe he had, oh, what if a woman was naked? Then we'll seem to, like, build Irene's character based all off of that. You know, I haven't seen the, I haven't seen any of this. I've seen, like, the first two episodes, as I said, so I feel a little bit of a fraud. Uh, but just the meta commentary, maybe, it sounds like Irene Adler was, uh, was the one really strong, clever, uh person who woman at least who would who really matched sherlock and maybe beat him and was powerful and so and and now in this uh this moffat uh rendition her power is being a dominatrix and being naked <laughs> yeah, this, she this had this had you know i hate to sound like a feminine Oh, wait a minute. No, I don't. <laughs> uh, it, 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 almost, it almost sounds like he doesn't like her. Mm. You know, like, like somehow uh, he has to do something to make her less. less. And I don't know if that, if that makes sense to people who have seen the uh, episodes or not. Oh, it makes but sense to me. What is a strong character, and he's building it down and sexualizing it because he can't deal with the idea that there was a woman that was powerful without sex really coming and, into it. Because, yeah, no one can beat Sherlock, too. Yeah, in this version, crazy. no one can beat Sherlock. It was completely <laughs> impossible, especially a woman. Oh my gosh, she would have to be taken by Sherlock and totally fall in love with him. He says the other thing I would like, I like Irene Aller as somebody who was trying to get out of a bad relationship. Because that was the entire plot line. She was in a relationship with this dick guy, and she leaves, and the guy is, like, all terrified that she's going to blackmail the shit out of him because he's a, you know, dick bag. Yeah. And sends Sher <clears throat> excuse me, and sends Sherlock after her. Mm -hmm. So, 
you know, and the whole point is she beats him because, you know, the expectations there are, oh, she's just a dumb woman and she's definitely out to do something terrible here. And all she really wanted to do was just take off with her husband and go live somewhere else without the asshole ex-boyfriend. Yeah, and, and in this version, uh, even Irene Adler is just not that clever either as that she has help. Moriarty sends her regard, his regards to Sherlock, and so, yeah. Yes. But yet, it's but yet she did figure it out with Sherlock in a way of a crime that they never were at. That it was a boomerang that did it. <laughs> that was in that same episode too. Oh my god! I'd forgotten about that scene. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> People don't like mysteries. You should not write mysteries. I I think <laughs> how that I think how that happened. They decided, oh, a clever setup for mystery. A guy that was killed, but not by a bullet hole, by a blunt object, and nowhere is the object found. And so they kind of wrote themselves in a the corner for that murder mystery, and they decided to just be. How would that be possible? A boomerang. That's the most logical explanation that we can come up with. So we'll write that earlier. Yeah. No, I would have gone with a thrown horseshoe. Had horse be in the field, throw a shoe, hit the guy in the head. The shoe like rolls off to it's more plausible. It makes yes. more goddamn sense to the boomerang. <laughs> Almost as silly. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I was in the UK when the, the they actually broadcast it when Sherlock was so excited by the first episode because I thought what the show was gonna be about was they were gonna take the various um, known stories and put a spin on it, like the study in Scarlet becomes a study in Bell, and so there would be a slight twist on the basic story so that you had all the setup, but you didn't know how the mystery was going to turn out this time, which it, it, it almost appeared like it could have been that, um, and they did that with the, you know, the final solution. They used the titles, but they never really took the ideas of the actual mysteries themselves. And, you know, what we were talking about with Irene, what is important, I think, for a character is to know the to that character, right? So Irene was an interesting character in the Holmes canon because she was an unlikely person to outwit him. Moriarty was evenly matched against him. But in this version, Irene Adler is basically, you know, like walking around making puff you know, half the, the episode. And Moriarty is almost godlike in his knowledge. Um, and so, yeah, there's no sense of proportion that actually challenges the main character in a way that allows you to explore what his possibilities are and, and have him show off in a way that's genuine to the character, not just... Um, yeah, being the hero all the time, unless, of course, it's Moriarty, because Moriarty is controlling everything. Mm. And then there's also the whole mind palace kerfuffle. <sighs> yes. Mind palace. I must have missed that. <laughs> oh, I actually the... learned that that is a real memory it technique, but just the way... Way... It does not work like that. And mm -hmm. neither can you say, I am a magazine publisher who has memories of all these blackmail things, and I'm going to publish my memories with no proof and no related evidence, and therefore you are blackmailed. Ha 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 ha. That would not work. It doesn't. Because, uh, like, the entire plot line just... No. Why? I'm sorry, I have a lot really... of anger issues with this show. And <laughs> That's it's okay. Terrible writing. That's okay. That's what we're here to talk about. The H bomb guys video. Why Sherlock sucks. He didn't dwell on the my palace shit enough. I mean, seriously, that was an epic asshole there. At the end, like, yes, I'm going to publish all your private information that I have in my memory. <laughs> To you know the the poor planning on the on the part of the writers because obviously they would have think that there would be more than one series, so you know why do you bring out your basically your big boss fight in a video game right they they brought out their big boss at the end of episode three, and you've already like if you started to battle you kill them off, but how do you set up somebody who's worse than the big boss I, you know it just everything about this series not be true which 
given how much time they had. Really astonishing that nobody, they never sat down and explained the script to someone and someone just said, <laughs> like the script for the room, if you took this, these scripts to a doctor, a good script doctor would declare it dead on arrival and tell you to go bury it in the backyard. It's just that bad. Hey, on a slight side note, that's kind of like the problem with like Doctor Who or classic Doctor Who is inconsistent writing. Um, oh. That's or if like the writing of the episode of a Doctor Who episode wasn't good, then what do you have? Some over the top acting and uh, cheesy cheap effects and stuff like that. So when the writing in Doctor Who, classic or new, is good, it is good. That's a problem when it comes to a long term show. Like, I don't know, I'm just going to come out and admit it. It's like, um, because I like watch those like American daytime kind of love in the afternoon type stories. And you know, and that's the problem when it's been going on for 60 years and then there's obviously a change of writer. So it's got to go through um, when it lasts for that long, it's going to be a change of writer. And sometimes that can be a good thing. And sometimes that can be a bad thing as well. Yeah, um, comics too, where you have great lines of comics, like um, when Peter David was writing X Factor and then when he left X Factor and suddenly Lorna has to work with the guy that raped her in the past and be totally cool with this. It's like, the fuck? The just variations in writing when you go from writer to writer and when new people pick up the characters and obviously you have no idea where they're going to go with it. Yeah, that's kind of why I'm a, actually am a fan of anime. I know for some people that sounds strange because when they think of anime, they think of long-running franchises like Naruto, Bleach, or One Piece, or Dragon Ball Z. Oh, and all like of Naruto's filler episodes. Oh, my God. Yeah, but, uh, it, yeah, but for me, it's just like the uh, the anime I love are anime that only have thirteen episodes or twenty six episodes. So episodes because in Japan, you only get one shot to do a TV show, and that's it. So you got to actually like condense the storyline and have it flow. Yeah. Did you watch Brotherhood? Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. I have not seen Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, but I love watch the it. watch I it. Should, yeah, Ooh. I should have heard it's really I good, but. Anime, which I thought, you know, really got twisted up near the end when they overtook the writer, but sorry. I no, I actually, well, I haven't read the manga either, but like that's also a problem with like manga. They go on forever and design to, so it can get tedious or it jumps the shark. But, but I really like the Full Metal Alchemist 2003 series, but that's why I love uh, anime. You just, you, you have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Unfortunately, with a lot of anime, they don't nail the landing, but when they do, it's awesome and i think that's one of those that's one of those things that i think is missing from american television is that idea that we're going to tell a story we have a definite beginning middle end we're going to do that and i think one of the most recent shows that did that extremely well well is the british show the wrong mans if you saw that the at least the first season they went in there knowing they had six hours to tell a story they told a story now they left a little piece there for a second story but at least they told a complete story that satisfied you by the time you finished spending six hours with them. Whereas so much American television, someone gives them a season, whether that's 13 hours to 22 hours to tell a story, and they fail to tell a story in that amount of time and then wonder why they get canceled for the next season. It's like you were given an inordinate amount of time to tell a story. People can tell a story in a 90-minute movie. Why can't you tell a story in 12 hours? So... There, there have been so many shows that had um, such potential like that. I, I can think of like the 4400 or um, the the event or things like that that just drug on because they didn't have a middle and an end to the story and just, just fall fell flat on their face, even though the concept was really good. Yeah, yeah when you were saying that, oh, go no, ahead. No, you go ahead. You, you go ahead, John. I didn't have okay. I didn't. Well, <laughs> You know, when you become an academic, you learn to do writing that's not only parsimonious in that, you know, using matter, but also that the writing is efficient in that you don't just put in something for the sake of it. You don't put in something that could be taken out and read completely fine without that thing. You know, everything connects. And when H. Bomber guy in the, in the video talks about that takes six minutes to start the third episode, of one season or whatever, but it's literally like six minutes of absolutely nothing happening until there's an explosion that's aimed at Sherlock. And then the, for me, I realized if you're watching it as a film critic, 
it must be like <laughs> me reading an essay where the student just spends like eight pages talking about nothing about the question. <laughs> and then like three pages in, they get into the question and then they only have like four pages left to tell what they really should have been talking about with the whole seven pages and um yeah they're just a kind of efficiency in writing and what reminded me of sherlock in terms of the way that it thing out is a show like lost yeah i, I just it's watched it cliffhanger. <laughs> lost more, more questions yeah yeah, I just rewatched the old uh, Dan Olson folding uh, ideas uh, video that he did where he talked about Attack on Titan, but was really talking about Lost because both the original manga and the show Attack on Titan had the same problem that Lost has, whereas their novelty was in a mystery. And so they, in order to like keep it up, keep it up and keep it new and exciting, they had to like create more and more mysteries. And that was a big problem with loss, especially with like a change in writers in between seasons. So by like season five or season six, they use like, we can't resolve all of these plot holes. So they just left it hanging and that disappointed the fans. You, you can only, you do so much with creating a new mystery, a new mystery, a new mystery. Eventually you're gonna have to figure out how to solve the mystery. Well, maybe not. You don't know how the mystery is solved. <laughs> oh, sorry. Was that Tom? Uh, I, I've been listening uh, again, uh, listening and thinking about what you're saying, and I wonder if it's the different incentives between uh, making sh movies or shows in uh, England. Uh, or so I'm sorry, Great Britain, the UK, whichever the fuck you want me to call you guys, or Australia. <laughs> Uh, um, is the way things are going. It could just be England and Scotland, you know, separate. But anyway. Um, and England only has itself to blame. Scots for him. Uh, but it seems to be a bit. Um, was like a. Uh, anyway. Ah, fuck, I'll get there. Um, it seems like in America or in, in, in Britain, what you got is money to make a show, to tell a story, and then it's, uh, you're, you're pretty sure it's over. Uh, maybe if it's really good, it'll go on, but maybe it's, you know, but you can't really plan on that. In, in this country, what you've got is a show that you want to milk for all the money you can get. And all the and the actors have an incentive to want to be on that show. They want to make a Friends. They want to make an NCIS. Uh, they want to make Law and Order and, and Law and Order Special Victims Union, Law and Order Los Angeles, and Law and Order wherever ever the fuck. Criminal and, intent and yeah, go ahead. <laughs> you know, yeah, and and it seems well, you know, and, and that's my thinking. I'm wondering if it makes any sense uh, to people from across the pond or the bigger pond uh, to the other side, you, uh, you Antipodian freezing people. I'll defer to Xander on uh, how, yeah, programming, unless you want me to make give my cross-cultural comparison, but <laughs> yeah. But when when expecting it to like last for four or five or six years, there's usually like broad church, it comes out, it's on for a bit. Um, English TV shows tend to have the very short but sweet leaving you wanting more sort of thing. They'll give you like three episodes, four episodes, then they're gone for like I was gonna, years, I was gonna like two say years. a bit like British men. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, uh, the seasons are only four episodes. Mm. Oh my god, are they amazing. Yeah. Oh. British friends. I never heard of this. I mustn't. I must look at this. Look up this up now. Eventually, after the call. British men. My apologies. Like short and sweet and wanting more. Um. But yeah, you know, you get commissioned. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> So I guess, yeah, so I guess Australia, um, so I guess what can we say about Australia? Like we've, yeah. we've got our kind of, um, just like everyone else, we've got a continuing kind of like um, soap opera type things. Like the UK's got like Coronation Street and America's got Days of Our Lives, Young and the Restless and that 
So we've got that, that, those. But then um, mm. I think we've got this awesome, like the unbelievably good primetime show. It's called Wentworth. Um, it's um, it's kind of like a prison drama. Um, like it started I love before. That show. Like, oh, do you watch Wentworth? Yeah, it's so good. So have you just seen season? I think the the latest no, season. No, I um I leave it for ages and ages and ages. They just binge watch it, so I haven't caught up to the. That's, yeah, that's how I did it because I just recorded it on my desk, desktop thing, and then um like whatever it is, and then I I did the binge watching, and it took me like the the weekend, and I didn't I obviously didn't go to bed that night, but um that's it was the same sort of thing. It was an adaptation of an original series um that was in the eighties, like it was called mm. Prisoner Cell Block H. And it's like um, well known throughout the world, but they took a modern adaptation to it, and it was um, I think some of the some of the seasons like they kind of left it um, on a not so much a cliffhanger. It was just pretty much you could almost think, okay, that could be the end of the season. But now they're sort of realizing, okay, the show's really getting popular, so now they're leaving it on a um, really like they've left it on an absolutely epic cliffhanger. So I'm not going to spoil it, <laughs> but yes, check it out if you can, if you possibly can on Netflix or whatever. What's the name of the show again? Um, it's called Wentworth. Wentworth. Okay. Yep. So much to watch. I mean, there's a lot of anime I want to watch, and a lot of anime that I own that's still in shrink wrap yeah. and stuff like that. I mean, I mean, Wentworth. It's like the um one of the the psycholo- the psychology of it, and just the um one of the main um you know the, she was the main pre- the governess of the prisoner, and then she became an inmate, and then um. You know the menacing. It was almost like this female adaptation of Hannibal Lecter. Like the um, like the acting was just absolute most disturbing sort of acting I've ever seen. Like a, this female embodiment of a Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> Did they? Was that off for air for a while and then came back on? Because I yeah, thought I was... saw a description about it. Like after so many years, she's back, and I wasn't sure if that meant the series was recommissioned or that was just part of the storyline. Oh, the season was just re. It was kind of re. It was kind of a reboot. Um, so they juxtaposed a lot of situations, like the. Um, I guess they changed the role of some of the characters, and it sort of and it became a something in its own right, rather than the. Um, because you kind of forget the original series after a while. So the first episode was a bit jarring because you think, "Hang on, I don't remember that um, person doing that." Or um, so they juxtaposed a lot of things, but one once you get to know those particular characters and the storylines take off, that's when it becomes. Very addictive. Yeah, because you either have to get people hooked on the character, or you usually develop. That's the point of a character, and right, or in the story that that character is in, like early Doctor Who. You know, yeah, Doctor Who is the main character, but it was the stories. And I think you know, with the Sherlock series from Moffat, Sherlock was supposed to be the center of attention, but he just stays an arrogant jerk the whole time and that's just not interesting <laughs> it's a driver for a story compared to a lot of the here and then the problems with like you know the mystery and um, you know what we were talking about before about then how you use your time which was Matthew's point about you know how, what can you do in three 90 minute shows you basically have three movies you can tell so what do you do in that period of time and how some people really waste their time and you know I think the the problem too is the uh, like Tom was saying, with the way that things get pitched in America, you get commissioned on an idea rather than a script, it seems like. If something sounds like it will sell, then it becomes the basis of it. And they don't always think through the implications. They don't have the time because as a writer, you need that time to connect. Like, you know, I, It started out not that great. I'm just going to, this is guilty pleasure, but the TV series Supernatural. Mm. First five seasons. You watch the first five seasons then they actually it's like a five-act play i mean it's it's big enough in its scope and its themes are consistent and the characters change within the main themes and then there's a big confrontation and sort of resolution at the end um and it's sense just like you know in in a very satisfying way that you can go back and look at these themes and put them together and see how things were set up or not so much here's a I don't think they set it up but they remembered they did something in season three and they tied it into something for season five you know they were aware of their well enough to be able to do that and that to me is like a sign of of a really a writer who understands what they've written 
kind of other series you think that lasted really well <clears throat> across time? I think the Real Housewives franchise, but that's not a, I don't know. I have to wonder if they've actually scripted that because it's like, it can't be a coincidence that they all, that all these women like are going to get together and have a complete nervous breakdown in the last uh, episode. Don't get into get American reality TV. TV. <laughs> yeah, the, I, I actually, I had a classmate of mine, a high school classmate of mine go on one of those reality TV shows. And one of the big things he told me was, nope, there's no script, but it's not real. <laughs> yeah. Uh, There's like uh, a no. There was an FX show called Unreal, and uh, Dr. Drew Pinsky, who I listened to on his like shows and other podcasts, has said like that that show Unreal is supposed to be a fake real. This TV show is so real he can like name you like the producers or the like the staff that like because yeah, that's pretty much it. That's how the, the reality TV is not real. Is those producers kind of like filming you and telling you say this, say that, go to her or stuff like that, or or they film like the confessionals, the one on one camera interviews with this. The, the participants wearing the same clothes so whatever you're saying they can like cut it into like something else to make it seem like they're talking about something else when they're talking about something totally different so that's how like a reality tv is just like unreal Sounds you like the, um, when when i look at australia i think of the because we've got the real housewives it's melbourne and sydney and the people from america are, are like desperate they're saying like you know when's when are you going to release the melbourne ones because that's like a favorite one because they've got all they want. They got New Jersey. They got you know New York and all that. But then they always want to see our Melbourne women <laughs> because they are. Because I'm so I'm proud to be an Australian because of that. <laughs> it's really weird with um, Australian television because you have quite a few iterations of reality television shows, and they're being rated the best. Like um, Australian yeah. MasterChef is being considered the best MasterChef of like fifty different MasterChefs and stuff, such yeah. and such. It's just uh, they just can create such a different vibe that they're just really interesting to watch. Yeah, I'm yeah, a big MKR just... fan, as I've confessed. Yeah, Matthew, <laughs> what were you going to say? I'm just going to talk something about what you had said a few minutes ago, Christy. Was uh, you know we were talking about this having the time to uh, tell a story that you know, six hours, three hours is ample time to tell a story. And one of the things I think about this Sherlock series is that they squandered the reputation of Sherlock Holmes, the character, uh, because, you know, he's a beloved character. He's been in so many different renditions of the storylines as produced in movies, televisions, plays. Uh, so, you know, they, they, they started on a really good footing and then just completely squandered the capital they got from already being on that footing. Um, I've seen that with other shows too. One of the ones I think did it one of the worst was uh, Battlestar Galactica. That first season, that those first couple of episodes in the miniseries were just absolutely amazing because it captured you, it drew you in, you wanted to see the story result. Now, granted, I would say near the end it started to falter a little bit, but then it redeemed itself in the final ending of that four season run of the show. And then this thing came out called Caprica that was supposed to be the prequel to Battlestar Galactica and it fell completely fat on its face. It it suffered from that problem of okay, we've got 12 hours to tell a story and they failed completely to tell a story. They ran it way too slow. And it's like the stuff they did in the episodes that they managed to make, they could probably have squeezed into three episodes. Again, parsimony and telling the story. They just went way too far in the background and anything like that. So it's squandering the capital your franchise already has, I think, is one of the problems in many television series, particularly the American ones. Yeah. I would totally agree with that. Um, you know, Johanna, I, I only mean to do because there was some background noise. I don't want you to not talk, but just because there was some background noise with Matthew. So, yeah, just uh, jump back in whenever you're ready. I, yeah, I think that's an excellent point. And Battlestar... I thought the first two seasons were the strongest because they had very clear stories to tell. There were existential threats to human existence, um, potentially really interesting dystopic questions to explore. For in 37,000 or so human beings left, a woman gets pregnant and she doesn't want to have a child. And the society allow her to have an abortion in that situation you know and if not because the survival of the species is at stake well then when do people get their own reproduction right back you know are people supposed to be is this their main job now and and so that's like an, a really interesting thing to explore but it's a it's the conflict between 
you know, the survival of this individual autonomy and how to deciding how to live your own life. Um, and those produce the best episodes. You know, that was that where you have the the issue about um, people rebelling against the government and and the president wanted to send out Captain um, or, or Admiral Adama to he had that great line that and there's a separation between the military because the military fight the enemy and the people and the police keep the civil order. But if you make the then the enemy of the state, like that's fantastic writing. <laughs> that's really interesting to explore. And by the end, when they ran out of that material, they were left with, you know, all along the watchtower, which was compelling emotionally. <laughs> so sorry, Galactica rant. I don't know if anyone else wants to jump on that. Unfortunately, I haven't seen any oh, about no. Galactica. I, I should, though. Oh, I was Lost thinking... World. Oh, sorry, I Tom, you go ahead. That... Go ahead, Matthew. I was just going to say, on the Battle of Galactica, was one of, I think it was at least the first two seasons was one of the best serialized shows out there today, and that's comparing it to one of my favorite shows, which was uh, Battle on Five, because it had a story arc that went five years. He had a definite beginning, middle, and end. In fact, I love how um, J. Michael Straczynski would always say he had a box of note cards on his desk that showed his vision of that universe for like a million years worth of that vision. He pulled out five years, made a show based on it, and knew the beginning, middle, the end, and has, other than that little thing with Legend of the Rangers, hasn't touched it since. He's just left it pristine on the shelf, and we can just continue to enjoy what he has written so far. So um, people who forget that and just try to keep shows going and going and going and going and going and going, like the, you, we were talking about the daytime shows earlier. When I, I don't watch them, but when I hear other people talking about them, it sounds like it's the same storyline over and over again. Like every year, the storyline just comes back around yeah. again. Sorry for interrupting. Go ahead. I was just going to say about uh, about the reproduction thing and the, the moral issues. That sounds like uh, uh, the story of The Handmaid's Tale. Uh, they have, uh, you know, uh, they have a problem reproducing. And what do you do in a society like that? You know, one of the answers is to uh, uh, make slaves of the fertile women. You know? That's one way to go. I don't know that it's a good way. I mean, this is yeah. why. Um, I, I, I would, I would no. say, I know it's not a good way. I'm just, okay, well, I'm if they I mean the survival of the species is a, in the words, it's a, it's a thought experiment. We're not enacting laws, so you know, it's. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we're not enacting laws now, but you know. Uh, under President Pence, I think there's a good chance of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. I didn't want to turn this too much into politics, but no, who is going to talk? I heard someone. <laughs> I was just going to mention that, like, uh, Inyo Studios, he's another YouTuber. He, he His latest video was about the Handmaiden's uh, Tale, and that was like, but he told me beforehand, I haven't seen all of it, that I should go watch the Handmaiden's Tale. So that's, that's obviously one thing I was going to add. Another lot of, yeah, another I've heard the same thing. Same thing. A lot of people have been raving about it. And I think that's what the studios kind of miss that. I know that there's a lot of emphasis in the summer blockbusters or in these TV series to make it sound flashy. But at the end of the day, what I think sells is a simple story that allows you to get to know the characters. What we want to do, we want to relate to people so that we can, we want to relate to people so we can be taken on their emotional journey. And then we want an interesting journey, you know, and so even though I, the Wonder Woman wasn't the most brilliant action superhero movie of all time. Why I liked it to compared to you know like some of the later Superman like the the um, the uh, when he was doing Superman is is like there's one baddie, goodie, the story of them coming together to have their con that's like that's easy you know i don't have to keep track of multiple plot lines and who is this person and you're still introducing characters like 50 minutes into the movie so I, that's what i think um sherlock one it doesn't allow you with the character and the stories that you get taken on you're not really you're just watching it happen to somebody else you're not journeying with the main character in that way i think i want to talk about 
of that too, because connecting to a character is really important in the story. And one of the things that can happen, you can definitely have a main character that you are disconnected from that nobody knows what's going on with, but then you have to have, you know, the point of view character, which was the entire point of Watson, you know, in the original series, yep. which kind of got ruined here. So that completely ruins that dynamic because it leaves you with a character who's completely unknowable, completely untouchable, completely, you know, removed from humanity in any you know, way, shape or form. And you're left with no way to actually understand or real or relate to them so yeah writing problems compare the emotional sherlock as he is in the bbc series and the american one does make some emotional steps things happen to him and he's forced to re-examine the way that he's thought about the world and he he changes but he changes in a way that's still consistent with being sherlock you know um and that doesn't um, to get more emotionally invested when things happen to him, like Irene comes back, all of the trauma that this has been hinted at because the writers knew how the series was going to end it <laughs> and have been setting up all these little hints along the way. Suddenly, all that has so much more emotional impact because they had a destination, you know? It, it's like the, the basic thing when you're writing an essay, people say, first in your introduction, tell them what you're going to tell them and then tell them and tell them what you told them. You know, you need to carry, you need to guide people through the story. And yeah, being able to set those little things up here and there that when you see something at the end, it ties them all together. It makes that emotional impact so much more. And what do you, what emotional journey do you ever go on with Sherlock? It's not, yeah, so. Hey, John Watson. I did cry at the John Watson scene of him standing in front of the, the, the grave, but that was more to do with Martin Friedman than his acting than the story, I think. Yeah. It seemed very cold and, cold and sterile. That's like even the, because that's one of the things that um, people look at. I guess, I guess how we, because that's how I was learned how to do it in school when they taught us about appreciation of media was to look at a lot of aspects. So there's, I think, I think, I think the color palette is something that, it, it does set a particular and it can be used very purposefully to create something that's either, you know, it can be cold and sterile or, you know, there's um, seem to lack any sort of warmth. Like, a, like when you think of something nostalgic, you think of like the, the warmth of a fireplace or something like that. Um, and that's like when you're watching a mystery like that, it's um, there's that kind of nostalgic feeling that comes from those warm sort of colors, but all I saw was this blank kind of bland color palette. Yeah on that got a bit of a swipe as well so um before we kind of go into the end i mean some of you do know sherlock but maybe we could just kind of um if you think about uh, a drama series like or something that you have enjoyed um what i look for like i said is um a, uh, taken on a journey so i'm in a well maybe it's an entertainment issue i don't have that much stress in my life i don't have like a, i don't have financial problems i mean i'm basically you know getting by nobody in my family has major health issues i don't have health issues and so i go into some like darker areas and take um, go on emotional rides <clears throat> that aren't happening in my life so when i go to television i go into escapism to sort of explore different ideas and so for me, the things I look, and this is what I'm asking you guys, is what do you look for in something that you enjoy in terms of when you watch it? Um, yeah, I want, I wouldn't want, I want to fall into a story where I don't want a lot of setup. I want to jump in right in the middle of the story and have to figure out what's going on. You know, like I want some clues as to what it is, but I don't want, well, John, you're my brother and you've been my brother since you were born 27 years ago. I don't want that kind of stuff, you know, just like get me right in the middle of the story, get me a little confused, get me caught up with it, and then give me a chance to get to know the characters. That's so a lot of times actually with an American, I'll jump ahead to episode four. Mm. Episode four and five and six. I might go back and watch the first four episodes, three episodes, but a lot of times like I don't want the introduction stuff. So for me, when I do my escapism, and it sounds like Troy that you're more interested in sort of like watching other people's drama from a slight distance and slightly <laughs> sometimes yeah it's um I think there's basically I think I always choose there's always like two favorites that I have so it's what I call like guilty pleasure television it's like um that's why I watched like the 
because I enjoy those all those housewife things because it's more of a it's an anthropological type of thing. It's like observing sort of human behavior. Um, it's like a case study of psychology and narcissism. Um, and so that's the and days of our lives, of course, and that's the cheap entertainment. But then the visceral thing comes from that that um like the Wentworth series I was talking about in the prison. So it was a much more um a much more well executed high concept sort of show. So I have to have one of each. Um, I don't used to have a middle ground. I will just comment on the term um, guilty. I'll just comment on the term guilty pleasure. Anything you find pleasurable, you shouldn't feel guilty of. Uh, it's called instead great trash because we cannot examine and learn things from in just great art without also examining great trash. It's like yeah, said, there's yeah. a. I like think within said, the like um within pop culture, so in classical art or um I guess quality art, there's good and bad. Mm -hmm. Um, so in the museum, there's good and bad. But in the um the lower, what they call like, I guess popular culture, there's good and bad in that as well. So even though something that seems like the guilty pleasure, there's artistic merit behind it. But um, some doesn't have any. So it's like, I don't I don't really believe in that false dichotomy between high and low culture. Yeah, I don't either. when you have a night to yourself first right now i've been watching american gods so i've watched it a couple times over again oh my god that is good oh i mean my gosh. Damon in general is always hands down one of my favorite you know writers especially when it comes to character study and the way he just applies the fantastic to that too and even like the study of belief and the difference between someone who doesn't really believe something unless they have evidence like in shadow and someone who's just a straight up nihilist like Laura. <laughs> so I don't know. I'm really into that type of stuff. Fantasy and character Pain. stuff. Oh my God. Yeah. If voice was turned into some sort of matter. It would be butter that you would spread on things that would just be like silk. I yeah. Think. That guy could read out the back of an air freshener from a toilet. Still sound like the most sexy thing ever. <laughs> yeah, he definitely has a great voice. He makes a great Mr. Wednesday. And then um, Ricky Whittle was a great casting choice for Shadow, too. It just always manages to pull off that sort of baffled, confused, angry look that <laughs> he seems to have, especially through the last couple episodes. I have to so watch that. You? I'm. Um, I actually uh, live in the, uh, or I, I'm from the town that uh, quote, where a lot of the uh, story happens. It's called Lake Clyde, I think. Uh -huh. in, in the story, that's uh, Menominee, Wisconsin, and Gaiman lives there or lived there for quite a long time. Yeah, I think he lives in Minnesota somewhere now. That, that could be, but he, but while he was living in in uh, in that in my town, he was saying that he lived in Min or near Min uh, in Greater Minnesota or near Minnesota or whatever, and so I don't know, you know, if he's still around or not, but that was uh, our claim to fame is being in that story. Uh, they talk they talk about uh, one of the stories that I love is about the uh, annual uh, uh, car on the ice. And then you know, taking uh, bets as to when the when the car is going to go down uh, in the spring, and and Damon took that and took it very darkly, mm -hmm. took a very dark place, and I loved it. It was such a great. Oh my god! It, it was and, I, and I and I found and I keep finding myself looking at at the at the. Lions Club clunker, which is what they call it here, this car on the ice. Aww. And I'm wondering who's in it this year. <laughs> so, John, did we hear from you yet? Because I'm going to pester Xander after. I want to make sure. Uh of uh, me, what I like to enjoy and watching in entertainment, I guess it, it, uh, anything good. It, it doesn't matter if you like, if you, if it's your focus on the world or just the procedurals and not then the characters are important. Just do something like well, I guess. I mean, it could be, uh, yeah, I probably do. I'm like you, Chrissy. I mean, I'm not rich, but yet I'm not struggling either. Uh, I'm in good health and my family's in good health. So I, my, 
normal day to day uh, life is kind of boring, which is why I would just watch for escapism. So some, and I am a bit of a geek. I grew up, my parents were geeks. So I grew up on Star Wars and Star Trek. And so I kind of like, and fancy stuff like they, we tried to read the Tolkien books and I couldn't get stand the, the over description of the trees in those books. Um, so stuff like like Av the Avatar The Last Airbender is great, but what's also great about that show was the writing was spaced out properly. It had a beginning, it had a middle, and it had an end. Even though the first two seasons did end on cliffhangers, they knew where they were going with that. And for like Legend of Korra, they only have they know that they only got one shot of one season they didn't know they had like a third fourth or uh, second third or fourth season so when they end the first season they kind of resolve everything but in the little days as machina kind of way it's just magical powers however how they resolve the villain was just whoa they resolved it that way for a kids show that's amazing but for the other seasons they knew they had um they knew they had more seasons, so they end those the second and third on cliffhangers, but knew where they were going. Um, yeah, it's just I don't know. Uh, it, I mean, even even like a, I'll just mention briefly about some of the side discussions we had in the chat. Uh, yes, a movie book or anything with a bunch of assholes can be interesting, engaging. Like Quentin Tarantino, his movies are about violent people. <laughs> These are not good people, but Quentin Tarantino tells the story. A, with these characters in such a way most of the times uh it's compelling so um, i'm coming all over the place oh and i'll also for entertainment for entertainment i like to watch educational stuff which is why i like the youtube fitness communities because i learned so much mm -hmm. yeah i heard we do kind of less repetitive content than uh, <laughs> than other places so um, let's see. So who still has left to go? Xander and Matthew, have you spoken yet? Go with Xander because I haven't heard your dulcet tones for a while. <laughs> um, I look at television and most visual media from a um, education point of view because I studied um, stories at university. Um, and absolutely number one thing is it's all 100% character. Character plus setting creates the story. And um, I'm quite happy that a lot of sci-fi and um, not so much fantasy, but sci-fi um, shows are focusing more on the character now. It's not all about the techno babble. Oh, look, it's the spaceship. Everyone look at the spaceship. But it's all about the characters put into that situation and where the characters go with that. So that's why I really like Battlestar Galactica the first few seasons, because that's what it was all about. Then suddenly it became about, oh, the universe, metaphysical bullshit, which is where Sherlock went as well, which is why I'm really not happy with Sherlock. Um, that's why I think American Gods is great. It's not about all the magic stuff. It's about how Shadow um, interacts with all of that, how he's the everyman who's like, holy shit, this stuff is real. Um, my favorite TV show recently has to be Westworld by far because, oh my God, it took, that was amazing. It was so good. It, it was 100% character again, put into that setting. It's like how people react and, um, realistic really react. That's the, another thing about fantasy and, um, sci-fi is that they don't react, um, realistically whatsoever. Like they're just not interactable humans that you can take seriously, which I'm really happy that Westworld and things are just taking that to the next level. Um, yeah. But I, yeah, but sorry, also I don't I got, interrupt. I just want to agree so, about Westworld. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so character is 100% the most important thing. But as it's been said before, I love watching trash. <laughs> I just love Good like track. anime TV shows. It doesn't matter. I just like watching stuff that just you just don't have to take seriously. So I can just sit back and enjoy whatever the hell is just going on on the screen. It anime just, is good like that. Yeah, yeah. It's it a just, pulpy media. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't like as long as it doesn't take itself seriously and knows mm -hmm. it's just oh goofy. Oh, we know. Let's just have some fun. Then I'll just watch that for days. Same here. That's what yeah. me and my brothers do. If we watch a different anime each night, or we watch a full series, four episodes at a time each night, but each one of us choose a different series. So, mm -hmm. yeah. We just watch one of a dragon maid 
it sounds like something where the writer's just like, dragon, me, <laughs> no way. Okay, let's see what can we what we can do with that. But it was actually good because it had characters. Mm. So yeah, while I look for the Westworlds and those are the the things that I really savor, I can't watch them repeatedly in a row all the time. I have to fill them out with just crap I don't have to take seriously. Yeah, some Westworld, shows like Westworld is are emotionally not exhausting. for the faint-hearted. Yeah, uh, that's why I was going to say I have the emotional space in my life to watch something like a Westworld. Because if if you have too much stress in your, your life, you shouldn't mm. be watching that. <laughs> it's it's a uh, it's hard work emotionally that show. Oh yeah. Uh, also, if you want to listen to Ian McShane a bit more, I would recommend the show Deadwood, where he co-stars in it. So it's just Ian McShane talking. I own it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, <own> it. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I haven't gotten so bad as to go back and get all the old um um love. What was it? Love crap? No, I want to say love crap, but that's not it. It's um, the PI character on British television. Love Joy. Love, love joy. joy. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Why did I forget that? I think, are, did you go yet? Or are you the last person to confess how I you went? You might be the last person. Yeah, Love Joy was my introduction to Ian McShane because I think I was maybe in high school or early college when that came out. Um, but as far as love television I watch, I. You, you know that I work and I spend most of my free time at the theater. So there isn't much free time for me to just sit and watch television. In fact, most of my television viewing has been watching movies because I've been systematically working my way through like the AFI top 100, the BFI, the BBC list. I finished the AFI list. I finished the BFI list. I'm working on the BBC list right now. So I've been watching a lot of movies when I get a chance to actually sit down. Um, but as far as shows go, my two favorites are two that I've already mentioned and we've, we've talked about today, which are Battle of Oh, your mic just went a bit weird. Sorry, it was going fine for a second. I'm just hoping if I interrupt you and you start again, it'll go good again. Where Saying the shows wrong? that you have been watching. The the two shows that I love mm -hmm. are Babylon 5 and uh, Battlestar Galactica. I haven't gotten into any of the modern shows. Um, the only two shows I tend to watch on TV are Daily Show and Real Time. Um, but I've been going through, like I said, systematically going through movies. So my flavor of shows are now almost a decade and two decades old respectively so i haven't taken the time to get into anything and what bothers me is i don't like the idea of getting into something only to have it canceled after the first season so i purposely don't watch something the first time around even though it leaves me behind in the office chatter so i'm, I'm more of a movie buff right now rather than the tv buff so that, that's what Can that's I... what i do with my time can i ask you a question about that then sure. um what do you think fit to you has been going through what other people rate as these fantastic movies what, what have you know now that you didn't know when you started out going through all of these i've learned more about storytelling watching what people consider great movies um and also i listen to steve shive and jason harding's uh movie uh podcast which of course the way that they analyze it in a funny way but they analyze it. they analyze the story they analyze the filmmaking and it even though i may not like the movie they analyze just using that critical analysis in my own life helps me understand more about what's going on in the story and of course i've worked on a couple of films myself and seeing it behind the scenes even though we're just doing the little independent films also, I, I end up, I, it's hard for me when I when my mind is still turned on. It's hard for me to look at anything on television and not wonder uh, how did the camera guy do that shot or what were they using to do this and that effect and, and things like that. So I tend to my, one of my problems is when I watch TV is I tend to overanalyze unless it's like oh it's the end of the week I'm tired I just want to turn my brain off. So that, that that's one of the things that gets me when I watch stories is. Uh, I have a bad habit of stepping out of that uh, suspension of disbelief because I tend to overanalyze what's going on in the story. It's like the the one of the worst things I ever see in the story, and it, it shows up mostly in science fiction, but it shows up in a lot of other things. Is you know, blowing the hole in the control panel to open the doors. It's like that's not how those things work. <laughs> I work in technology, and I know that's not how those things work. And it's other things, you know. Anytime they throw computers in, say, like Criminal Minds or a CSI, and it's like, 
that's not how you hack a machine. And that's not even a valid IP address on the screen. Uh, it's, it's things like that that I can't, I can't stop doing and things like that. So I sometimes just have to avoid shows that I know are going to do that. I think there's a new show on the air called Scorpion. Um, and I know a lot of people like it, but they do things like that all the time. And I can't suspend disbelief in the midst of this just techno babble that is completely wrong. Like, I don't mind Star Trek style techno babble because you're talking about theoretical stuff that doesn't exist. But when you're writing a story that happens c contemporary to us right now and they do techno babble, it's just like you're just talking shit. That's not how you solve crimes. <laughs> Oh my god, I get like that with the forensic technology. I've done a lot of reading and studying on that, like the crime scene stuff. And when they go in, it's like, we got DNA from the air, more or less. And now we know that this guy is like six foot tall and has green eyes, and we can fight. I you have know? a friend who is an actual forensics person. She works for the army. And yeah, she, she can't watch those shows just because they're so bad at that. My mother is an ER nurse. She can't watch shows like ER in Chicago Hope because she sees just how wrong everything in it is. And I, I know she's watched like the first season of ER and every episode she was like, that's not how you do that. That's not how you do that. That's not how you do that. <laughs> like, they should just hire me as their technical consultant because they're so wrong. <laughs> Yeah, I know whenever I watch like an episode of Morse, uh, uh, Xander will know more about Morse or any uh, detective show where it's like our offices were never that plush and nobody's having that much sex. <laughs> like, I can't, like, but that's always what's happening on the university cases. Some professor or some assistant is having sex with this person. I'm like, yeah, this is not my experience. So from a slightly different experience, yeah. You can't watch things that are too closely related to you because... Because I've, um, you know, because um, I major in mathematics, so I felt uncomfortable watching that Russell Crowe film, like, um, oh, watching beautiful him, mind. Know, beautiful mind. Yeah, I found it uncomfortable because I'm thinking, because I'm thinking, oh god, I know how that to be like obsessive what about and. Good Will Hunting. Yeah. What did you think of that one? Yeah. Sorry. Good, Good Will Hunting. Good Will. Yeah, that was that kind of made it was uncomfortable with that one as well, and then anything to do with because there's um comedy shows that are about that are set in schools like with oh. teachers and that and, and i just and even though they're meant to be comedy they're too close to reality to um and it makes you feel uncomfortable what about that show numbers what did you think about that numbers <laughs> <laughs> yeah the same thing i just didn't um i couldn't do that um like anything that's too close to home it doesn't <laughs> work for me it's like yeah, it's i i only managed to get up to like college calculus and i'm watching that show and it's just like where did you come up with that <laughs> yeah my my older brother has like a, a programming degree and yeah he he knows the terms that is discussed in numbers but he's just like yeah he can't take that show seriously either <laughs> this is great trash that's what it is <laughs> it's, um we've been about 20 after and we started a little bit late so i was like let us run a little bit longer um we're gonna wrap it up here to go as well so maybe before uh, you guys actually leave the hangout don't go anywhere i'm going to hit stop recording um we can have a bit of a chat on what we can if we just want to have a general chat next week or if we want to have a theme but for those of you who are watching in the audience um the recording is going to stop now so i am just going to say before we wrap up thanks to my guests i haven't really done a themed talk before and i appreciate you guys willing to take the time to watch you know the video that H Bomber guy did. If, if some of the episodes I didn't realize, I mark that was uh, really a bummer. <laughs> yes. Can I add one um, thing? Chat interesting. Can I add yes, one of course. thing? Um, just as we leave, and you know, we're talking about um, the uh, the brains behind Sherlock and how shit that was. <laughs> Moffat, um, yeah. Moffat and Gaddis, Moffat and Gaddis apparently have um, are, are going to do uh, Dracula, the series. Yes, they've been given Bram Stoker's Dracula. Oh, so, God. Not, yeah, yeah, so go, go, go for it and feel really shit about that. <laughs> exactly.
<laughs> there's another you know like icon Ben Moffat will somehow but I was I, I was actually thinking that maybe with Dracula this would be a good fit because the story is all about Dracula well I mean because the story is like about Mia and all that stuff but really it's about Dracula so maybe this is a case <laughs> where his egoism and his obsession with having the Ubermensch as his main character will will play into and also I'm planning on tweeting them um H Bomber Guy's video review until they either acknowledge it or block me. <laughs> uh, they do need to see that. Need to watch that that video. So thanks Tom. As long for as, long as, the, as long as the vampires don't glitter in the sun. No, vampires, <laughs> I can believe vampires sparkling in the sun about 0 0.2 seconds before they explode. Yeah. As I said before. All right, so anyway, yeah, we're going to chat off air and we're going to talk to you, know, you guys if you want to watch this uh, next episode next week, Sunday. It'll be up on the channel. Thank you guys for watching. Thanks again. To and all that's left to be said is that I've been Christy. These guys have been awesome over there on my camera where I'm backlit and I'll talk to you guys again really soon. So bye from all of us. Bye. Bye.